we just started our recording so we'll post this video on our youtube channel um it'll also be available on social media but i wanted to thank everyone for coming um joining me on the call is kelsey hansen our outreach coordinator she's having some microphone issues so uh unfortunately i will be giving the introduction instead of kelsey she's great but she'll be um uh organizing all of the wildlife wednesdays moving forward so we're excited to have you all here um and kelsey you can go ahead and do the next slide great so uh we have some recommendations for how you can view this wildlife wednesday um we're going to try avoid zoom bombing so um if you could keep your microphone and video off to conserve bandwidth and keep the focus on our amazing presentation that would be great um we also uh are privileged to see some wonderful photos that elizabeth has gathered so if you want to view this in full screen mode that's how we recommend viewing it um and then if you have any questions throughout the presentation there's a chat function in your toolbar go ahead and ask those questions and at the end kelsey and i will be moderating those so um go ahead and type as you see them and then we'll we'll get to them at the last 10 minutes or so and the most important thing of course is to enjoy and learn something new quickly i'll introduce alaska wildlife alliance we are a nonprofit uh, founded by alaskans in 1978 and uh, our mission is to give voice to alaska's wildlife and um, one of the most important ways to get people to care about wildlife is to learn about them and we're lucky to live in a state with experts studying um, a broad array of wildlife research and so um, bringing those presentations and education to local communities is really important to us um, and we uh, though we do do more than education and kelsey can show the next slide um oh yes and first to mention our southeast chapter so uh we have a southeast chapter based in juno some of these faces might look familiar pauline irene linda and tommy um and so we do some local advocacy and education in juno and we're very grateful for their board membership so give them a thanks if you see them around town Uh, we have a number of different projects going on uh, involving advocacy, citizen science, and of course education. So um, you can find more information about these on our website, but uh, last week we filed a lawsuit to protect a threatened polar bear species in Alaska and the South Beaufort Sea. We also do citizen science monitoring of endangered species, such as the cook and the beluga whales. And then um, our blog posts have a lot of education about wildlife and different activities um, involving habitat and ecosystems in Alaska. So we encourage you to check out our website or join our mailing list for um, a once a month newsletter. And here's just a couple more examples um, for Juno folks. If you've been on the new electric bus, you might have seen our signs about keeping trash inside and reducing bear encounters. So um, we're very grateful to volunteers who made that possible. Um, as I mentioned, we're seeking volunteers for um, beluga monitoring up in the Anchorage area. Um, we're also at various fairs and festivals throughout the year. And um, one advocacy point is uh, coming up for the trapping season. We have a map the trap portal on our website where you can document trap encounters, um, just so we're understanding where trap um, conflicts exist if they do in any communities. So um, yeah, all of this information is on our website. Of course, we have some upcoming events. Um, we have Wildlife Wednesdays on multiple Wednesdays of the month. So the first Wednesday is the Southeast chapter, which you're viewing now. Um, the second week is a statewide or Anchorage area um, based Wildlife Wednesday, but all of these are remote, so you can join from anywhere. And then the third Wednesday of the month is focused on our Kenai Peninsula chapter. And so you can find all of these events on our website. Um, we also record all of our Wildlife Wednesday presentations, so you can share them later. Um, and then we have wildlife walks in various communities across the state. We also have a uh, wildlife photo photography calendar contest going on right now. So you can vote for photos that will be in our 2022 calendar on our website. And coming up this month, we also have a pumpkin carving contest for free swag. So if you're um, interested in 
carving a pumpkin about wildlife, we would love to see your submissions. And information about that is on our social media, Instagram and Facebook, and on our website. Um, so thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, if you are interested in supporting AWA or becoming a member to support programs like these, um, Wildlife Wednesdays can only continue because of the volunteerism of presenters like Elizabeth tonight. So we are extremely grateful for her time um, and for our members who donate to make this possible. So um, you can support us by selecting us as a charity on Amazon Smile. We are also a pick, click, give organization. If you're a federal employee, you can give to us through the combined federal campaign, um, or you can sign up as a member at akwildlife.org. Great, and without further ado, we'd love to turn this over to Elizabeth Graham, who is going to be talking to us about Western black-headed budworms. So um, Kelsey, you can go ahead and stop sharing and we'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm gonna try to share my screen here and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk today. Um, I. Uh, had given a similar talk at the evening and Egan lecture. So um, if you were at that one, this might be a little bit of the same information, but uh, I'm, I'm hoping uh, you'll still be enticed. Um, I'm gonna turn my video off uh, for the talk just because I have a, a couple videos in here. I don't wanna slow down the, the bandwidth or anything, but let me know if there's any issues that come up um, as I'm presenting here. So uh, yeah, Western black-headed budworm. Uh, this is not what you're typically used to hearing, I'm sure, in your Wildlife Wednesdays. I had a couple people say, you know, why are you presenting at that, uh, at that series? And, and I had to remind them that, you know, insects are animals and, and part of, of wildlife. They're the uh, charismatic microfauna instead of the charismatic megafauna that uh, most people are looking at. And so the, this little uh, Western black-headed budworm, and if you don't see it, it's right here on your screen. Uh, the little uh, blends in very well with the hemlock needles there. Um, and it's a, it's a small moth, but um, as I say in the title, it, it's really one of the driving forces of change uh, in the old growth forest here in Southeast Alaska. So just a little bit about me. Um, uh, as uh, Nicole said, uh, my name is Elizabeth Graham. I'm an uh, entomologist and um, I'm at the Forestry Sciences Lab, which is um, right next to the University of Alaska Southeast Campus um, here in Juneau on the um, land of the Aquan. And uh, I work for the Forest Service and for a division of the Forest Service called State and Private Forestry. And then we have a, a group that's called Forest Health Protection. Um, and this is a little bit uh, sometimes new to people. They, um, even in the Forest Service, may not have heard of state and private forestry. And sometimes people think that means I work for the state um, or I work for a private industry. Um, but, but what it is, is it's a division of the Forest Service that's uh, meant to encompass, um, you know, work on all lands because our, our insects and diseases, you know, they don't recognize property borders. And so, uh, the work I do isn't limited to just the national forest. We can um, help and give technical assistance on, you know, whether state, private, uh, any any type of land. And so um, we have a website here. Um, I can uh, post the uh, link here in the chat when we're done. Um, but uh, this is a, a great resource for information about forest health in Alaska. Um, for our mission with forest health protection is to protect and enhance forest health by providing landowners and managers with information and resources. And this is one of our best resources. We put a lot of information on here um, about different diseases, uh, insects, invasive plants, um, different things that are happening. We um, have also been trying to be a little bit more proactive getting the information out right away using social media. Uh, we have the, the hashtag Alaska Forest Health. And then if you're on Facebook, um, you can follow the two national forests um, and we post a lot through them or on Twitter through the uh, Alaska Forest Service page. And so, um, you know, I've been in uh, Alaska now for over nine years and um, 
workforce health in Southeast Alaska is honestly typically a pretty easy job. Uh, there's not a, a whole lot of disturbance agents, um, unlike some area uh, of the, the country. Um, and as far, you know, working in a healthy forest, we, we do have a few things, but um, there's not a lot of landscape level disturbance events that happen. Um, one major one is yellow cedar decline. Um, that's a, a complex of events that have to do with um, a freezing injury and that's impacted yellow cedar across the landscape uh, here. Uh, we also have abiotic uh, disturbance events like flooding, landslides, wind events. We just had a crazy wind event last weekend here in Southeast, over nine, 90 mile an hour winds I heard. And um, I just went out and looked at a whole bunch of trees that got knocked down because of that. Um, spruce beetle, uh, you know, folks up in South Central are very familiar with spruce beetle. We do have that here in Southeast Alaska. Um, it's not a uh, major problem as it is up north because we have a much wetter environment. It's not as conducive, but it is still here and occasionally um, has caused small uh, pockets of mortality. Um, but the biggest thing that we really have had um, over the last hundred or so years of uh, forestry here has been these defoliator events. And I got to see my first glimpse of one, um, which was this hemlock soft life feeding damage. Um, this was right off of uh, Ketchikan back in 2012. Uh, but a defoliation event is an insect outbreak where it's so great that it causes damage across a vast landscape. So we're not talking about individual trees being impacted, you know, maybe uh, a few spots here and there, but this is something that, you know, it's gonna be, uh, you're gonna notice whole hillsides being impacted. Um, and this can occur when populations rise to such a level where the natural controls that normally keep populations in check either aren't there or aren't able to keep up. Um, and so here in Southeast, we have um, a couple Defol uh, defoliators that are responsible for these big defoliation events. And these um, outbreaks can either be cyclical where they happen on a 30 to 40 year basis, um, or they could be triggered by certain environmental conditions, or it could be a combination of them. And so here on the right, we have um, one of our main defoliators, the hemlock sawfly. And this is some of the damage that uh, it caused back in uh, 2019. So as I said, we have the, the I really should have named uh, this presentation, um, Hemlock Sawfly and Western Black-Headed Budworm um, as, as driving force a change in our forest because uh, the two of them both play a, a role. So on the left, we have the Hemlock Sawfly. And on the right, we have uh, the Western Black-Headed Budworm. And uh, I know that's a, a bit of a mouthful, but that's uh, the common name that was bestowed upon it. So I try to do my best to use the, the proper common name that the Entomological Society of America um, has me use. And uh, what's interesting about these two defoliators is that they have very distinct uh, feeding habitat, feeding niches. So the hemlock sawfly feeds on the older needles of hemlock. Uh, as you can see here on the left, it's got all these older needles are chewed on, um, almost all missing or wither or half eaten about fall off and the old new growth is left pretty much untouched. Whereas the Western black-headed budworm, as the, um, the name budworm implies, it actually starts in the buds of uh, the hemlock. And then as the, the tree, uh, the needles elongate, it'll start feeding on the new growth. So uh, what's really a, a, an issue is when we have both of these outbreaks happening back to back or simultaneously, because then you have the uh, whole tree that can be impacted. So often the first question I get about um, sawflies is what is a sawfly? Uh, so a sawfly, it's, um, we have the, I put the little uh, phylogeny here for anyone who's a taxonomy uh, fan. So they um, fall in the order Hymenoptera, which is the same order as the ants, bees, and wasps, um, except they're separate from those guys because they're in, in the group called Simpsata, which are called the, the broad-waisted broad wasps. And uh, they get their name, sawfly, because of their ovipositor, which is here on the um, bottom right. 
and the ovipositor is what the females use to lay their eggs and and it's got like these serrated edges on it like a saw and so they use that ovipositor to um, saw into needles or leaves and uh, lay their eggs inside of it and so it's a very broad diverse uh, group of of wasps there's quite a few species we have here in Alaska that feed both on uh, you know uh, the, the deciduous trees, the conifer trees, you know, understory plants, huge, large group of sawflies. Um, but the biggest one that we have as a pest here is the hemlock sawfly. Um, so here on the, the top, we have a male with its uh, feathery antennae that it uses to find the female. And then down below here, we have the, the female and in very small, they don't sting. Um, you know, they, they couldn't uh, hurt you if they tried. Um, so not a scary wasp, but uh, they they feed in aggregates. So these are the larvae here. And so they kind of look similar to a caterpillar um, and, you know, have similar uh, behavioral, but it, it, instead of growing up to be a, um, instead of growing up to be a um, butterfly or moth, they grow up to be uh, this uh, wasp. And so uh, it's uh, native endemic to the forest here. Um, and it, Western hemlock is its main host. Uh, however, it will feed on other conifers, um, usually to a less extent. Um, as I said before, it, it prefers that older foliage. Um, and uh, it will eventually feed on the new stuff, but it's not you know, nutritionally adequate for, for the um, soft flies to complete development. Um, and the, the crucial thing is that their populations are controlled by, uh, there's some parasitic wasps and other um, predators, but the, the main thing is this uh, entoma pathogenic fungus, which um, infects the sawflies and um, usually keeps their population in check. Uh, however, when we have drought conditions, like we had in Southeast in 2018 and 2019, um, like most fungi, the, that is not conducive to uh, development of that fungus. And so if that fungus couldn't develop and spread, it led to um, a buildup of the soft fly population. And that led to an outbreak throughout Southeast Alaska. <clears throat> so uh, the life cycle uh, starts off as an egg that, uh, the, as I said, the females lay their eggs inside the needle. So um, here's actually where a, um, the larva, when it first hatches, will feed inside the needle, kind of starts off as like a needle miner and then choose its way out. And then uh, it goes through several larval instars. Um, they all have this uh, black head and the green stripe running down that gets more and more pronounced as they uh, go through different molts. Uh, they pupate in the, um, in the fall. And, and when there's an outbreak, you can find these pupae just about everywhere. It's almost like picking berries. They, they will uh, pupate on the understory on hemlock branches all over the place. Um, and then the adult. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, one thing that they can be pretty variable. There's several different color morphs, but this uh, stripe running down the side is, is one of the more characteristic things that hemlock stop by. Uh, so we had an out, uh, oh yeah. So we also have our other main defoliator, um, the Western black-headed budworm. And so, as I said, this is a moth. It's in the um, order Lepidoptera in the family Tortricid, which uh, are these just kind of small rectangular shaped uh, moths with kind of a mottled gray pattern. And they can also be quite variable. Uh, they lay their eggs. Uh, so the moths have, were adults were active just now. Uh, if you were in Juneau the last month, you most likely encountered one fluttering around you somewhere. Um, they lay the eggs singly on uh, the underside of hemlock needles. This is uh, an egg, that little yellow dot. Um, caterpillars will hatch about the same time bud first. Um, so they have it time to synchronize with hemlock. Uh, and then they will feed throughout uh, July and into August. And that's when uh, pupation occurs. And about three weeks later, we have uh, adult emergence. Uh, so the one cool thing about the budworms is that they create these little shelters. And so this is a little budworm in his shelter there, the little black stripe behind his head. That's where they get the name black-headed budworm. Um, and so they uh, create 
tie the needles together at the end of the branches and create these little shelters that they'll both feed in there, hide from predators, and, and they can pupate. Um, and then the adults, I said, they could be quite variable. Um, when uh, the feeding starts, it'll actually start up in the higher part of the canopy. So it'll go up in the crown is where um, the caterpillars prefer to, to start and the, the moths will lay their eggs up in the middle and upper crown. And so uh, often what we'll see before we actually see any signs of the caterpillars or anything like that, um, we'll actually start seeing a buildup of frass in the, on the understory plants. And uh, frass is just a, a, a nice and polite way of saying uh, caterpillar poop. And so uh, in some places, if it was a uh, heavy activity, you know, this would be raining down on a day where it wasn't raining. Um, and so it, it, it would sound like it's raining, but you see it kind of build up on the, on the devil's club and that's the, the frass. Um, but when you get a, a high level of activity and you have all these shelters on the end and they, they're what we call wasteful feeders. So they'll feed about halfway through a needle and leave the rest behind. And then that needle turns red. And so what ends up happening is you have the tree with this red glowing appearance. And then you have caterpillars all over the place and um, they, they have this great behavior. I'm gonna to try to play this video, hopefully it goes through, uh, but they have this great behavior, I like to call it hangling, where they uh, will drop down from a silk thread and they'll um, swing and they may go to a new branch, if, you know, looking for a new place to feed. Um, they may be trying to evade a predator. Um, you know, the, the, I would think that it'd be a lot easier to find them when they're doing this. But uh, they, they go kind of up and down and um, are just all over the place. So um, if you spent time in Southeast this summer, you may very well have run into them in the woods. Um, they, were, they were pretty abundant. Uh, these are some photos from Bob uh, Armstrong. He's a naturalist based here out of Juneau and has uh, an excellent website called uh, naturebob.com. Um, he does a great job of uh, capturing some of these great uh, insects uh, and some insect plant interactions and other things like that. Um, and this one, we think it's a female laying an egg right here. Uh, but you can see they're quite variable in, um, in, co in color patterns. Like this one's got this cool stripe that goes down the side. That's one of my favorites. Um, but they're pretty small, um, you know, less than the size of a penny. Um, and the, when they're abundant, they're, they're abundant. Uh, these foliation events have been happening in Southeast. Um, that's really been the, what brought uh, entomologists here uh, in the first place was because of these major defoliation events. So we've been conducting our aerial surveys um, <clears throat> more formally since the 1960s. And the defoliation events have, there's basically been two main culprits and that's been Western black-headed budworm and hemlock sawfly. And uh, with the budworm, it, <clears throat> the outbreak can happen on a, a 30 to 40 year rotation. Um, so we have the one that we just uh, experienced here in Southeast. Um, and then there was one in the nineties uh, that was pretty, pretty mild. And then uh, right before these surveys, was one um, that took place in the 1950s that I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail some of the history of that. And uh, it's pretty similar to what we uh, seem to be experiencing here. Um, so it really, the first one that was, was recorded and reported was uh, actually in the 1917 and 21. Um, and they sent in some specimens. Um, they were never preserved, but it was most likely Western black-headed budworm. Um, and this uh, was widespread defoliation throughout Southeast. Um, <clears throat> in 1948, uh, their defoliation started to rise in some areas of Southeast. And uh, that got the attention of the um, regional or the head of the Bureau of Entomology, which was, uh, he's sort of known as the father of forest entomology, uh, R.L. Furness. And so he um, sent uh, William McCambridge, who's pictured here um, in 1952, to be the, the first entomologist stationed in Alaska. Um, and McCambridge has uh, since written a lot of excerpts on um, you know, his time there. And I mean, he's since now passed, but 
um, there are some great stories about some of the work uh, in, his, in his experience as well. Uh, being an entomologist in, in that time. And, and one of my favorites is the stories he told about going to the Red Dog Saloon and dancing until the sun came up and um, you know the, all those fun tales. So uh, great, great to imagine. Uh, but he did some pretty thorough work. Uh, he dove right in. Um, we've got some of these old reports posted on our website um, if you want to take a look. Um, and and it was it was pretty crazy. Uh, so this is an excerpt from 1902. Um, he said that there were very heavy moth flights observed in Ketchikan, Hollis, Wrangell, Petersburg, Juno, uh, several others. Pilots for Alaska Coastal Airline and Ellis Airline Company stated that when flying between Juneau and Ketchikan at altitudes of 2,000 feet, bugs would often hit their windshields in such numbers as to impair visibility. Insect remains found on the windshields proved to be the budworm moths. Uh, they also found the same thing while mapping the Rousseau Range, flying at 4,000 feet over glaciers and barren mountaintops. And then personnel from the U.S. Geological Survey reported making a count of 65 moths per square foot on a snowfield east of Juneau. So a lot of moths up there. This also made news. Uh, it was, this is from the Daily Alaskan Empire from uh, July 3rd, 1953. <clears throat> War declared on insect rustling no, I'm sorry, insects rusting the Alaska evergreens. So rusting is a good description with that uh, red tinted color from the um, ends being tied. Uh, so they mention how McCambridge has now um, been credited with perfecting a spray, which will kill the worm, which feeds on spruce and hemlock needles until the needles die. And the worm is the villain. However, what was his discovery? is that a spray of 2% water emulsion of DDT was effective against budworm. So yeah, that was uh, uh, quite the discovery and not a surprise that DDT is, an, is in fact effective against um, budworm because it, it killed most insects. Uh, they explored this a little bit further in 1963. Uh, they actually looked into the feasibility of doing aerial spraying of DDT. Uh, this was done in, uh, as a pilot project on Prince Wales. Um, they tested a couple different, um, they did an airplane and a helicopter and they had a, a, a floating base uh, as the, their supply from. Um, here's the helicopter, the floating base. Uh, very, very detailed reports about um, using aerial DDT sprays and, and the, all the logistics of how it ha would have to happen. Uh, they found a spray at the rate of uh, half a pound per acre was 100% effective in killing the budworms and sawflies. However, McCambridge then said, <clears throat> was quoted as saying that the concern that the amount of DDT that would eventually enter freshwater streams the adjacent salt water would be a drawback. We gave up the idea on budworm control. So fortunately, this was the only uh, massive or aerial spraying attempt with uh, any insecticide that I know of here in Southeast. And unfortunately, it was uh, quickly realized that it was um, the environmental impacts would be far greater than uh, what it's worth. And one thing that's uh, important to remember with these um, uh, budworm outbreaks is they often disappear just about as fast as they rise up. And so uh, it, it, by the time you would get the organ organized in order enough to do any kind of project like that, the, the outbreak would have already subsided. So uh, they realized that back in the 60s as well, because the um, outbreak they were working with was, was very small and contained. Uh, they looked at temperature in a few different studies. Um, there, there's a lot to indicate that warmer, drier conditions uh, and summers precede uh, an outbreak, that that helps to build it up. Uh, there was one uh, study from British Columbia that uh, sort of went the opposite way and said that uh, if the larvae uh, deal with conditions that are greater than 75 degrees, that that can slow down their growth. Um, so that uh, seems a little bit 
<clears throat> difficult to, to believe. It seems like the colder temperatures would be more likely to play a role. Um, they uh, identified over 16 parasites and predators um, that are here in Southeast Alaska. And what's interesting is just, you know, in British Columbia, there's over 48 that they know of. So uh, very few um, compar comparative to other places. Um, and then as far as uh, volume loss, in some areas they found there was a, almost a third net volume loss as far as hemlock would go. Um, often uh, spruce wood can be impacted, but uh, usually it's not as great. Um, damage was worse in mature stands, more than 50% uh, western hemlock. So uh, uh, the, the biggest factor is the stand composition. It, you know, if it's a, a, a mixed stand of um, hemlock and spruce, that would uh, fare better than a stand of pure hemlock. Um, However, a stand of pure spruce would have very little impact. Um, and then one of the greatest impacts is top kill. Uh, that was um, 84, uh, that was very common in many of the, the stands, especially with the dominant hemlock. That uh, seems to be what's the first. And then, um, but uh, of the ones that were top killed, in many of the cases, uh, they would have a new leader about two years afterwards. Um, however, there was an, an estimate of over 100,000 acres of mortality that was associated with this uh, outbreak back in the 50s. And then they they looked into DDT, the DDT and other large scale treatments, um, but quickly realized that they're not worth the environmental impacts. Uh, so that was back in the the 50s, right before you know we had our formal surveys, and then. Um, it, after that, we really didn't see a major outbreak again until the 90s. Um, that one was pretty short-lived. It, it, it rose up uh, in uh, 92, and then by 95, it was, um, you know, gone again. Uh, a few outbreaks here or there have occurred in Prince William Sound and um, some other areas further north, um, but typically they're kept at lower levels, um, which a lot of that is likely due to climate. Um, but then we get to here, where uh, in 2018, uh, 2019, we had um, this hemlock softfly outbreak. And then uh, in 2021, we've moved on into uh, this now Western black-headed budworm outbreak. And um, I do want to point out that this, uh, this data for 2021 is still in uh, the reviewing process. So this is all still an estimate and um, we, we're still working on that. And these are all from our uh, aerial detection surveys. Uh, so in 2021, um, we first heard about this hemlock softfly outbreak from uh, people living on Phyllis New Island, uh, which is right off of Angoon. Um, in uh, Admiralty Island, uh, and what they noticed was that their trees were turning brown and large amounts of that frass that um, I mentioned earlier falling everywhere. Uh, we had actually already finished our aerial surveys for the year and hadn't found any damage. This was about two weeks prior to that. Um, but with uh, uh, the caterpillars and the soft flies, they do about 90% of their feeding in their last instar, their last uh, larval stage. And so that's where you see most of the damage. So it, it's not going to become apparent until, you know, that really last stage, which can, which can sometimes only last a week or two. And so that's what, um, why it kind of seems like it comes out of nowhere. So we, uh, thanks to this information from the public, we were able to quickly scramble and uh, do a follow-up survey, and we found damage on Admiralty, Mikoff, Kupernoff Islands. Um, so, uh, and a little bit on Prince of Wales as well. It was about 48,000 acres um, in 2018. So 2019, we um, were able to get out on the ground, and we, you know, we knew from a few spot checks that it was Hemlock Softfly, but we wanted to confirm throughout uh, the different islands uh, in areas in Southeast, um, what, who, who's actually doing all the feeding. And uh, so we conducted these ground surveys using what's called the beading sheet method. And so that's where you stick the sheet underneath a branch and you get to beat on it. And uh, this is our uh, former seasonal technician, Isaac Davis, uh, checking out the soft fly count on a sheet there. 
Um, and so just merging all our different plots throughout these islands and uh, different um, locations uh, and just looking at the average number of um, sawflies per tree or, or the percent of trees with sawfly, um, what we found in 2019 is, you know, some places like Nick Hoth uh, had, you know, over 90% of the trees, individual trees throughout the area that we surveyed had uh, hemlock sawfly. Um, the lowest was over in the Sitka and Baranoff um, in Ketchikan. They had very little uh, sawfly activity compared to some of these other places. And then as far as the budworm activity, it was actually very low. Um, you know, most places we would just find them once on occasion, less than 10% of the time. So just to sort of demonstrate how dramatic uh, this change can be, um, for folks in Juneau, this is probably a familiar site. This is the uh, Jensen Olsen Arboretum. And uh, this picture was taken uh, by Merrill Jensen, um, the former caretaker there, uh, May 2019. And then if we fast forward to July, uh, this picture here on the left now, um, you can see the side by side, the one tree um, here has been hit by hemlock sawfly. And so really just two months later, it's, uh, you know, browned on the inner crown and lost a whole bunch of his needles. Um, it's actually still hanging on. It looks better than I thought it would now, but uh, um, yeah, so very quickly it can happen. Uh, the way it looks from the air. And, and again, it, it looks a lot worse from far away than it does up close. Um, you know, remember the soft light speed on the, the older needles. So you, you still get that green tuft on the end. Um, so our aerial survey in 2019, uh, we recorded about 380,000 acres throughout Southeast of uh, hemlock sawfly damage. Uh, 2020, uh, you know, that everything was different in 2020. We couldn't fly our aerial surveys. Uh, we did something instead that's called scan and sketch, um, where they took uh, high resolution satellite imagery for um, certain, you know, some locations where we had it and uh, looks for damage that way. But, you know, it's not as good, um, not, not as easy to do. Uh, and, and so we did record though some uh, defoliation on over 100,000 acres. And then we also recorded what we thought was mortality uh, from the outbreak on um, about 80,000 acres. Um, the 2020 also got cold and wet again. And so um, we did had some people out looking for uh, larvae and Sawfly population had dropped throughout the area, um, but we did start getting reports of caterpillars tangling uh, over on uh, McCloth Island. And then 2021, we got back to a little bit more normalcy. Uh, we had a return of frass falling though, and uh, we did some surveys in uh, the uh, McCloth and Wrangell Islands and it, uh, here in Juneau, and uh, it was just the exact uh, reverse of what we had in 2018 and 2019, where most, uh, many of our trees uh, had budworm, whereas very few with hemlock sawfly. And um, in many cases, we, you know, had reports from different areas of the caterpillars hanging, lots of grass, and uh, trees turning red. So here's a video of our aerial survey, and you can kind of just get a sense of the scale of um, how much damage this outbreak can, can be. You can hear me saying wow in the background. This is uh, over on Admiralty Island, where um, you know this is this is mortality that's likely associated with that hemlock sawfly outbreak, um, and potentially some other factors. But uh, you know this is this isn't just top kill. These trees are definitely um, dead. Uh, this is here on the right. This is Kills New Island. That's uh, where we've got the first reports from. Uh, we continue to get reports. <clears throat> Thankfully, our uh, Contacts there have been really detailed and thorough um, with the information, and it, it's uh, they've had the soft fly, the budworm, and now they're actually getting a lot of um, hemlock looper activity, which is another caterpillar. So 
Um, we're hoping that things will, will subside there and their trees can get a little bit of relief. Um, so this is a, a draft of our survey this year. We're, again, as I said, we're still uh, working on the data. It's not quite ready to come out, uh, but we're estimating about 500,000 acres of damage. Um, and then for Hemlock Southfly outbreak from before, we think we have about 200,000 acres of top kill and 100,000 acres of mortality. So <clears throat> those are some big impacts. And uh, Sometimes, you know, it, it, it's uh, people look at, hear these kind of talks and they think, well, how do we fix it and how do we get rid of it? And uh, it, it's important to remember that, you know, we have a forest that is uh, dynamic and, and disturbance and change is part of any forest. And we don't have a lot of those disturbance agents. And so um, this, is, this is a disturbance agent. And so, you know, you can kind of see that, that landscape level um, that th this causes change. And so, you know, there's both negative and positive impacts. Uh, we've got, you know, the negative, the obvious decrease in radial growth. Uh, you know, the trees are not gonna put on a lot of growth when there's very uh, few needles. They can't do photosynthesis. They can't, they're not gonna grow very well then. Uh, there's gonna be some top kill. Uh, in some cases that leader will get replaced. In some cases, they'll never put on a new one. Um, and then mortality, that's, you know, the ultimate negative as far as the tree's perspective goes. Um, positive, it opens up the canopy for understory plants. You know, this picture in the background here, look at the light shining through that. If that were, uh, you know, three years ago, there would be hardly any light, even on a, a sunny bluebird day like we had. Um, they're an abundant food source. There's plenty of, uh, you know, small mammals and birds that, you know, are happy to, to chomp on, on these uh, caterpillars and, and sawfly larvae that are, are out and about. And then also it, it's a nutrient pulse, all that uh, caterpillar feeding, um, you know, the frass, the needles breaking down, all of that is, is started decomposition. It's going to spend extra nutrients into the, into the soil. Um, but to quote one of my predecessors did a review of the, the 1950s outbreak and you know all indicators are that the current outbreak is probably similar and on par to this 1950s one. And um, John Hard here in, in the corner, he, he put it very eloquently and he said, the budworm is not an intruder to Alaska's virgin forest ecosystem, but a natural and perhaps beneficial component. Defoliation may cause dead trees and unsightly stands for a few years, but the energy and nutrients stored in the host needles are released during the rapid recycling process of an outbreak for use by surviving trees and other animals and plants. Increased solar radiation and precipitation reach the understory, understory and soil surface until the crown canopy closes again. Therefore, large scale defoliation and virgin stands should not necessarily be viewed with alarm since stands have recovered from past epidemics. And so it is important to, to remember that, you know, 30 to 40 year cycles that these outbreaks are occurring. Our trees are several hundred years old and they've been through this before. And, you know, hopefully they'll be going through this again. Um, so in summary, these defoliator events, like I just said, have been happening on a 30 to 40 year rotation. They're one of the most significant drivers of change in the forest. Now, one of the questions I get a lot is, how is that gonna change with climate? And my answer to that is right now, I don't know. It, there's a good probability that this uh, rotation window could, could shorten. We could be seeing outbreaks more like every 20 to 30 years, um, but we'll, we'll see what's in store. Um, it's also important to remember a healthy forest is resilient. And so uh, it can withstand these events and it might not look exactly the same after, but you know, we need to have these disturbance events to create gaps in uh, new wildlife habitat and, and things of that nature. The current outbreak, uh, it's likely gonna continue into the next year. Um, I just did some quick uh, egg surveying after that windstorm and um, I'm finding a lot of eggs right now. So that's a good indicator that we're gonna see um, this outbreak continue next year unless some, uh, something happens weather-wise to, to slow down their development. 
Uh, typically, we see about a two to four years before the outbreaks crash, usually about two years in one location. Um, and then the recovery after the, uh, these events can take several years. And, and again, as I said, they don't always look the same after. So I, I try to stay optimistic and, and remind uh, folks that uh, this is a natural part of our forest and um, it's gonna be great. But um, for those here in Juneau, this is a spot on the uh, Spalding Meadows, John Muir Trail. Uh, this is that first bridge where the, the little waterfall is. And you know, I, I look at this spot and I think, oh, are, I hope these things don't make me a liar. You know, I really hope that in five years I can come back to this spot and, and have a side-by-side -side picture to show you that you know this this looks great and lush again. So hopefully we'll we'll have me back in a few years and, and I'll be able to, to show that. So with that, I can um, end here and turn on my camera if there's any questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And yes, we would love to have you back in five years. Um, we won't call you a liar if it changes, but um, <laughs> that was a really great, great presentation. And um, I encourage if anyone has questions, I see a couple coming in, but I'll just give folks a minute. Um, go ahead and type them into the chat function. Um, and then also it's difficult while we're not um, here in person. So you can't give applause or um, tell Elizabeth how she did. So if you would like to leave any notes or comments um, in the chat function, that's we, we share the chat with her and so she can see that later. Um, and then I also wanted to say that uh, Bob Armstrong is one of our advisory committee members. He's great. I'll throw his website into the chat box. Um, lots of great photos and videos. And, um, and it's just, I think, uh, showing all of the news clippings and hints that entomologists are really fun. You guys are fun <laughs> dancing. And um, so, yeah, this is, this is fascinating. Um, and yeah, and I just put the um, link to the uh, Forest Health Protection website in the chat. And like I said earlier, it's a great resource for folks. Um, lots of information on there. We're always updating stuff and yeah. Great. Well, um, we have about 12 minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and get started on questions, but um, please feel free to um, enter your questions. So one from Kelsey, is there a definitive link between an increase in other wildlife populations and the budworm population? So yeah, that, a bird? that's a great question. And I would like somebody in the Alaska Wildlife Alliance to find me the answer. Uh, because yes, I am an entomologist. I'm not a bird person, um, but it is something that it, it makes sense. And, I, and I've looked in the literature and um, there is uh, some reports of budworms, and warblers, and, um, but nothing with this species or um, you know, any direct correlation. And I think it would be a really cool thing to, to look at, especially with um, you know, this sort of big outbreak that we have right now. And, and I know that there's lots of um, you know, both fish and birds and stuff that can take advantage and are getting to, you know, eat all these things. So if anybody uh, <laughs> is able to answer that question or wants to research more, please get in contact with me. I would. <laughs> yeah, we need a master's or a PhD student or something to take that on. Um, Pixie says, when the hemlock branch has all those larvae, so 30 plus larvae, um, are those all from one pupa? So, yeah, the, so the pupa is um, the larva after it, when it's about to turn into uh, an adult wasp. So, um, and then the, the females, they'll lay their eggs. They actually lay the eggs singly on a bunch of needles on a branch. And then when they hatch, they just kind of migrate together. So it's sort of a an interesting thing with, um, did not all sawflies do that, but the, the hemlock sawfly does. And it's neat because when they're feeding those groups, it's kind of like a defense thing for, for like predators and stuff, because there's so many of them, you're like, oh, you know, it kind of works. <laughs> there, there's, there, you're overwhelmed by larvae. <laughs> this is great. Um, really good questions too, everyone. Um, Jonathan is asking, in the chart of budworm and sawfly prevalence, is, 
uh, it seems that when one spikes, the other does not and vice versa. Is there a relationship between the species that prevents prevalence and abundance from both spiking at the same time? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, and, and right now that's just been, a, I think, a lucky coincidence. Um, in, in the 50s, there was some overlap and, and there is a, a occasion where, where that's happened before, um, where both uh, are active at once, but um, it's, it's also worrisome because it happened with the, the soft fly outbreak happening first. So, you know, those older needles, in some ways, they're not that valuable to the tree. They're willing to give them up pretty quickly, but then when they don't have new needles, it's, uh, they, they need something, you know, and so that's sort of their, their reserve, their savings. Um, and, and so, yeah, having these back-to-back -back outbreaks is what we really are concerned about and wanting to look at moving forward is, um, are we going to see more mortality or top kill related to that? Um, while folks type in any um, other questions, I had a couple. Um, it seems like you rely a lot on local input. And so as we're talking to a Southeast audience, if people see these changes, is there a way, what, what's the best way for them to communicate or get involved or even, you know, are there citizen science opportunities that they can help? Yeah. With? And that, that I usually keep a, a slide at the end of my talk, but I, I forgot on this one. Uh, we have actually been doing a lot with iNaturalist. Um, that's been a, a new tool that we're still exploring, but um, it's a great citizen scientist resource. Um, you know, it's a great resource just for hobbyists, uh, you know, and you can take pictures of any um, insects or things like that upload them to iNaturalist and, and people crowdsource it. They'll, you know, right away, they'll tell you what things are and, and stuff if you don't know it. Um, and so what we are able to do is, so you can, if you're already on iNaturalist and uploading stuff, you're actually helping us and don't realize it because we'll pull any of the things that we're interested in, like budworms or um, soft flies or things like bark beetles, you know, things like that. We can, we can pull all those observations and then um, incorporate that into our reporting. And, and so then other ways to get a hold of us is, of course, email. Um, I can add my email here in the chat. Always really happy to field questions from anyone. Uh, pictures are so valuable. Um, you know, if you see something, take a picture, send it to us later. Um, and then also reaching out on our website. There, there's, we're a small team, but I like to think we're mighty. You know, <laughs> we have uh, three entomologists in the state. There's one in Fairbanks, there's one in Anchorage, and there's one in Juneau. And then we also have uh, two plant pathologists. They specialize in forest diseases. Um, and we have invasive plant specialists and also some fabulous uh, biological scientists as well. So we try. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's remarkable. It's a lot of area to cover. And um, yeah, if you wouldn't mind putting your- Oh yeah on the chat um that would be great and kelsey put in the um the inaturalist.org link there too i i did not know that sounds great we'll we'll definitely share that to our members as well um and uh i had one more question but i'd like kelsey's which is what is your dream insect to study oh that's a good one so you know what's interesting is i um for my PhD, I studied longhorn beetles, which, uh, you know, have their wood borers with big long antennae and they're super fun. And I, I studied chemical communication with them. And then I, I got this wonderful, fabulous job here in Juneau and, and I love it so much, but we have hardly any longhorn beetles here. And it is just like the saddest thing to me. And <laughs> You guys up in Anchorage and Fairbanks, you get those awesome uh, Sawyer beetles with the black and white antennae. And I know not everybody loves them, but I'm always jealous of that. And so I really miss the longhorn. Oh, <laughs> that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I don't see any new questions. So I'm going to keep my last question. And then I also encourage if you can access the chat to send any kudos and Praises, um, because Elizabeth, you spent so much time putting this together, and we really appreciate it. So thank you for that. Well, yeah, um, I definitely appreciate the the chance to talk to you guys. So this was a lot of fun. 
and I know this breaks out a little bit from the um, entomologist specialty, but um, I was shocked to see all of the DDT that was put down. Do you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there were impacts to that, but um, for people on Prince of Wales Island or surrounding island, do you know what the impacts of that was? So it, it sounds really bad by like hearing about it now, but it actually was really minimal. So it was a very small area. It was, it was very well contained. Um, I, I was more concerned, not so much about the uh, aerial spraying, but about the advising people to go out and spray all their ornamental trees. And so fortunately that did not take off. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't, um, you know, I don't know how much measurements were taken afterwards, uh, but it, it was never pursued further. So it, it would, I, I almost had a heart attack when I heard about it initially. I'm like, oh my God. So yeah, I didn't think they had ever done any DDT applications up here and uh, fortunately it ended quickly. So. Okay. Oh, <laughs> wow. Well, great. Well, that's, that's a really good <laughs> um, well, I'm getting a lot of thank yous, great presentations, great insight. So um, thank you so much. Phenomenal. We're getting all the adjectives here. Um, so I am going to go ahead and stop the recording.